I have a great HOA and Karen video for you today. Here's our first story. The whole homeowners association gets Tyrannosaurus wrecked, literally, posted by deleted. I used to live in a two-story townhouse in Vancouver around 2010 with my parents. Keep in mind that this is in Canada where HOAs are not as common as the USA and are not seen as evil. But this HOA was different. First, the characters. My mother was a 50-year-old woman working at a grocery store, and as we were Muslims, she wore a headscarf. She was a very nice woman to everyone that she met, including people that she knew hated her for whatever. Kill them with kindness, right? I was in engineering school and about to graduate in a few months. My father was a regular working man. He is not important in this HOA story. What the problem was, these HOA jerks were a group of fat, possibly retired and stay-at-home moms and dads. They made bullcrap rules like, all the floor mats must be straight, and inspection of your suite will be done bi-monthly, and the worst, which was, no overnight or late night guest. We owned our residence, and here these jerks were trying to ruin it, making it seem as if we were tenants. My family was wanting to bring my grandmother to Canada, and the visa just made it through. We were excited to have her, so we go to the airport and come back with her, meeting of the HOA butts on the way. She asked us straight, who is this and why does she have bags? Wait, what? I said she will be staying for a month and it's my gran. The hippo's eyes locked onto my gran and said, you can't be here, <laughs> right? Since she didn't speak English, my gran looked in confusion. In the end though, my mom and I had a large convo with this jerk and she agreed to give us one last warning. Whatever. The next day at 11 freaking PM, the jerk knocks. What's wrong? I am going to let you know that I will have to issue you guys fines if I cannot see your mother's back on the security cameras. Her face was visible, but I need a proper view in case we get burglars. What the heck? It was late, so I didn't argue, so I just went back without telling my mother. The next day, she does this same ordeal, but with my mom. She was furious and she told her to leave and to not be racist. The HOA jerk yelled, Islam's not a race, you freaking slur, witch, and left. I will never, ever forget that night. My mother wept like a baby for the night, and it was the worst freaking night of my life, second to only when she passed away last year. I could not see this BS continue. I did what I thought would be best. I went around, and I took questions from every single house and asked about this bee. They all said the same thing, and on my way home, I noticed a freaking fine being written on our door for failing to keep our floor mat straight. It's a circle. How are we supposed to make it straight? At any rate, I spent some time on Reddit asking legal advisors from Canada on what can be done. They all recommended I get a form of proxy for all residents. That will let me vote for them just via myself. I got around 50 people out of 60 to sign it, and boy was I ready. The next election, I voted every single one of those jerks out and I made my mother the head of the association. I got the position of vice president and I removed all of those rules. The next day, I made the rules for our new HOA and all it said was literally this. This HOA exists only to make sure no other HOA can take its place. There are absolutely no enforced rules here besides keeping your portion of the hallway clean and no interfering with other members' residents. That, my friends, is how I made the old HOA extinct. The jerk people became really friendly afterwards. I screwed up by fooling around with a neighbor who's on the HOA board. I know this is a first world problem, but it still sucks. I'd fooled around with a neighbor who happens to sit on the board of our building's HOA. It hadn't been an issue until recently when I declined to fool around with him. I learned that he had been dating some girl, and as far as I can tell, she does not know that he has an ex friends with benefits in the building. Feeling uncomfortable about the friends with benefits arrangement, I told him very politely what my reasons were for saying no to a request for a action. We'll leave it that way. 
I had to remind him very calmly and rationally that he cannot grandfather in doing stuff when he is in a relationship with someone else. Life does not work that way. Well, I think he's angry. I can't prove it without a lot of expensive legal fees that I don't think is worth the squeeze, but in short, he sits on the HOA board, and I'm pretty certain that he's an influential voice on the Architectural Improvement Committee. This is the committee that residents have to submit unit alteration applications to for approval. Yes, even something like wall mounting TVs or putting a planter on the balcony. One of the items that needs pre-approval is outdoor furniture. I imagined it was pretty pro forma. Fill out the application, make sure it's heavy enough that it won't fly off the balcony and hurt someone on the street, and bam, approved. When I saw this set that I liked for an outdoor refresh, I placed the order because I thought it would be approved without problems. It was a limited sale and a very good deal. Then I got the rejection on Friday. To make matters worse, the furniture had already been delivered because it took the HOA forever to review the application. The reason the committee provided was that the color of the sunbrella cushions were not consistent with the aesthetic of the common spaces. I immediately replied with a question. Why did Unit X get approved for their teal cushions and mine got denied? Their reply was that it was an oversight. Moving forward, they would not allow unapproved colors anymore. I just know it was him. I can't prove it without getting an attorney and alleging inconsistent application of HOA rules to pose them and find out. But again, the juice is not worth the squeeze. I can get new cushions that are neutral, but I can't return my fun cushions and I'm out several hundred dollars because of it. This sucks so much. Do you agree with this answer? So first off, your HOA should have official records. Any decisions on the Architectural Control Committee are part of those official records, including emails concerning those decisions. You as a member have access to those records and they cannot refuse you access. So request to see the records related to your refusal and you'll know right quick if he was involved. He should have recused himself after disclosing his conflict of interest. If he didn't, tell the rest of the board of directors and they'll fold pretty quickly to your request or even request his resignation, which seems like it would all be to the best. All that aside, I should note that in most states, they have to respond to your request for a proposed architectural change within 30 days. If they don't respond quickly enough, you can absolutely move forward with the change and they can go pound sand. Given you note that they took forever to respond, they might have already effectively forfeited their right of refusal to your request. This one got messy. What would you do if you were OP here? I would push it further, possibly, but man, retaliation. Homeowners Association board member causes a crappy Christmas posted by Nevada Drifter. Our lovely HOA has decided that should you choose to decorate your exterior for the winter holiday season, your lighting may not have two consecutive bulbs that are the same color, unless all of your lights are the same color. Last year, I hung my usual blue lighting and intentionally swapped in one red bulb just to tick off our HOA CCNR enforcement officer. It took two days before I had a friendly phone call, another three days until I received a certified letter, and an additional five days until a $50 violation fine showed up. The holidays passed, and I continued to fight the fine. I refused to pay it. Late fees started to build, and eventually I was summoned to an association meeting. I compiled a list of some of the most insane HOA regulations that I could find to compare to the insanity that I was dealing with. I admitted that I changed the bulb intentionally and I pled with the HOA board to have a little reason. It turns out that while a majority vote was needed to pass a new regulation, a unanimous vote is needed to change or repeal a regulation. All of the HOA board members, with the exception of one, who just so happened to be the old woman who cited me for the violation to begin with, agreed that the rule was unnecessary. This old hag proceeded to argue that, even though she didn't live on my street, my lighting had ruined her Christmas, and presumably the Christmas of everyone on my street. Finally, someone on the board pointed out that, while they needed a unanimous vote to change the regulation, they only needed a majority vote to remove another member of the board. An immediate vote was taken, and the lighting jerk was removed from the board. A motion was made to revote on my case, and it was immediately dismissed. How I screwed over an anti-race, horrible, bigoted business owner and likely resulted in him going out of business faster. 
posted by Reddit admin dumb 87 This occurred in a southern state. I won't mention the state cause, well, you'll see. I was an account manager for a digital marketing company. We sold lead generation services to business owners to generate leads. One of our key selling features was, if you turned on call tracking numbers plus recorded phone calls, we'd guarantee you X amount of leads based upon Y spend. And if we failed to meet that, you'd be entitled to partial or if we really failed, potentially full refunds. Some things to know about advertising. A CTN is a call tracking number. It's a unique number that's assigned to a certain point of advertising that consumers call. This number is only on that piece of advertising. It routes to the business line, and unless the consumer is very observant, they have no idea that they're using a CTN. Call recording. If you turn on CTNs, we can record the calls and store the audio on our servers. The business has to consent to this. Also, when you call, you'll hear a message. This call is recorded for quality assurance type message. Both of these are required to be eligible for our service guarantee. Story time. Part 1. The Lay of the Land. The business in question was a small dad and son contracting company with a couple employees. They primarily focused on smaller jobs, such as windows, drainage, finishing, and so on. Unfortunately, this business owner was a royal pain in the butt. He went back years and his account was filled with nothing but complaints. Also, there was a strong suspicion that he was anti-race because his last account manager was African American. The business owner, who we will name Scott, refused to ever meet in person with the previous manager. Also, I was white. He had no issues finding the time to sit down with me and tell me how crap our service is. Well, it's coming up to do contract renewal and he says we aren't producing his leads and he wants to put in a claim for failing to meet our service guarantee. I spoke to my manager about this and he said he wants me to listen to his calls, write a detailed report and present my findings to the manager. The manager is worried this may end up in court due to the dollar amounts involved. Nearly a whole working week of hours, I probably spent dang near 40 hours on this, and I wrote a detailed 24 page report outlining the results of our advertising. To say that I shredded this business owner's business practices is an understatement. The report was a straight up attack on his poor customer service skills, disorganization, inability to execute, and complete and total failure of anything resembling any sense of standard business practices, well, that just make logical sense. I will share with you a few examples of the types of calls I listen to. Small calls where multiple phone calls are truly epic in their total incompetence. Customer 1 I was a small time landlord who had three different properties that had received a quote from Scott for work. The landlord had accepted Scott's quote and agreed to do business. In one voicemail message offered to pay a deposit to start work. Throughout four voicemail messages, this poor landlord went from, hey, I want to pay you, to, are you okay? to, why the heck aren't you returning my calls? Yes, I said voicemails. Scott had gone out to this man's properties, quoted his pricing, and then straight up refused to do anything more. Why? I legit got no idea. I called the customer in question and said I was a quality assurance agency and was doing a survey on Scott's performance. The guy ended up paying Scott's competitor about 15% more to do the work and was utterly beside himself on why Scott ignored him. I was also confused. FYI, all my calls were recorded and put into the company records. Customer 2 This one in particular really ticked me off. Again, the public housing office called Scott to get a quote on work that involved 25 different homes. Scott was kind enough to answer the phone this time, which ironically was one of the few freaking times he ever answered the phone. Initially, Scott sounded happy to get such a big profitable job. Then Scott learned two things. It was Section 8 housing, and it was a neighborhood that was African American and Hispanic. Immediately upon learning this, Scott informed the housing office that, unfortunately, he's super booked, not true, and that this area is actually out of his service area, not true again, and the housing office was confused, and they were like, uh, so you're not interested in bidding? And Scott said, no, I'm not, and hung up. He didn't even say goodbye. So I did a quality assurance call to the housing office and the lady was completely confused why Scott wasn't even remotely interested in the job. Luckily for Scott, the lady didn't connect that Scott was an anti-race jerk, caused discrimination against a protected class is a crime. Customer 3 
It was an overseas phone number from Japan. A service member stayed up late to call Scott during his business hours. This person told Scott he was deployed overseas. Still, over the weekend, someone broke into his home back in the States, where Scott operated out, and he was trying to arrange for a new door. He mentioned this was an emergency, as his wife was being forced to stay at a hotel. Scott never returned his calls, nor made any effort to contact him on the email he provided, nor called his wife, who was local. It was a super easy job that Scott could have done in about an hour or so and made a solid profit. I think that's enough examples. Part 2. Review and Plan The actual report at the end said out of the X phone calls, Scott failed to properly service the leads in about 70% of the cases and that I could keep on going on. Still, I felt X number, a clear trend had been established. It wasn't that our service wasn't producing leads for Scott, it was that Scott was an anti-race, bigoted jerk who everyone freaking hated. Obviously, I said that in more professional language. When I presented the report to my manager, he looked at it and went, dang, 24 pages. I asked if it was fine, and he smiled and said, I got a pretty good idea of what this is going to say. He said he'd review it and get back to me. So, a day later, he came to me and said he'd gone over the report, and the VP had gone over the report, and he asked what I thought the recommended course of action should be. My recommendation? Remove all discounts, charge Scott total price for our services, and clearly explain that our job is to provide him with leads. It's his job to sell those leads. If he can't convert our leads into business, that's not our problem. Scott was getting a 70% discount. Our price was built with discounts in mind, and my manager was like, uh, he'll probably cancel. And I asked my manager, and is that a problem? If Scott was going to remain my client, he was going to pay dearly for that privilege. If he wasn't willing to pay, I was happy to let him walk. My manager smiled and said, nope. Part 3. The Meeting My manager and I called Scott and arranged a meeting. I created a PowerPoint summarizing my findings. About a third of the way through, Scott gives in and tells me just to get to the point. I knew this was going to be a heated meeting, so I wanted my manager present both as a support and a witness. So I explained that it's our job to bring him leads and it's his job to sell them. His failure to do that is not our problem. He gets irritable and whiny and my manager backs me up. He goes, fine, I'll renew my contract at the same rate, to which I go, uh, yeah, you see, you didn't let me get to that part. We have new pricing for you. Scott goes, yeah, lower? And I go, <laughs> oh no, oh no, not lower. My manager smirked, and Scott asked me for the new rate. I hit him with the full rate, which was three times what he was paying. Scott is furious with me, says I'm overcharging him, says I'm ripping him off, says I'm a horrible salesperson. He tells my manager that I should be fired for treating him like this. My manager looks at me, and I had been waiting for that moment. Truth be told, I gave zero craps what Scott thought of me. If anything, my goal was to get him to cancel. Scott, you're a challenging client, therefore the pricing of our service needs to reflect the challenge of providing you service, so we will be charging you our full rate. If you like, I'd be happy to go over why this ROI still makes sense based upon our past performance. This was wording I had gone over with my management before using it. My manager felt it was fine. I felt so amazing to say those words. It was the nicest way I could say, you're a jerk, if I'm going to work with you, it's got to be worth my while. Scott says we are a bunch of greedy freaking jerks. He says, I'm going to cancel. To which I said, well that's an outcome that we've decided is acceptable if that's what you choose to do. Scott huffs and goes, uh, what about my refund? Dismayed, I go, Scott, we've clearly demonstrated we did our part. The reason why you aren't bringing in sales is because of your company's inability to close on the leads that we generate. To which Scott goes, so you're saying that I don't know what I'm doing. To which I say, Scott, if you agree to sign at the new rate, I'd be happy to sit down with you and to help you free of charge on how to improve your sales techniques and close more of your leads. This is me telling him that he doesn't know how to run his business and was very much meant as an insult. Scott goes, nah, screw you, I'm calling my lawyer. And I go, so I take it you're not going to renew? He says, heck no. And my manager goes, well, that's fine. Would you like us to email you our report on your leads? Scott goes, sure, I'll show my lawyer. FYI, we never heard from Scott's lawyer. We wish Scott a good day and he leaves. 
Later, we wrote him an email, attached the report, and also told him that if his lawyer would like the recording in question, we can send that file over as well. Our bases were covered, and we knew it. I suspect he also came to the same realization, but had too much pride to admit that. Part 4. Make sure that dagger is nice and deep. A few weeks go by, and my manager says that we gotta shut down his account, so I need to call him and ask what he wants to do with his CTN numbers which we control. In our contract, we say at the end of the agreement, the customer has the right to have the numbers ported over for a fee. It would have been normal to waive the fee as a gesture of goodwill, but Scott desired zero goodwill and he received what he desired. I tell my manager, there's no way I'm porting the numbers for free, and just like his quote, I'm charging him the full rate, $15 a number. The total came out to just a bit over $100. So I call Scott, I get his voicemail, but he doesn't answer. I write him a registered letter, and in that letter, I outline that he has 30 days to respond. We have his CTNs, and if he's willing to pay a $15 per number port fee, we'll transfer those numbers over to his phone provider. One morning, I woke up to about a dozen hateful text messages in which Scott told me to go freaking burn in heck. I took that to mean that Scott was not interested in porting over his numbers, and I reviewed those texts with my manager. We saved those messages and uploaded it to his account. So, is that all? <laughs> of course not. Part 5, but wait, there's more. So here I was with seven CTN numbers that had been in service for literally years. Those seven numbers were saved in Scott's customers' phones, and to many of Scott's customers, those numbers were Scott's number. Obviously, they wouldn't be advertised to anyone, but that doesn't mean they won't produce phone calls. Now, if I just let the numbers die, the customers will call and simply be told this number is no longer in service. Now, I'm not entirely sure if what I did was legal, but it's been quite a few years, so I feel comfortable about introducing you to Bobby. Bobby was another Southern boy, but as much of a butthole that Scott was, Bobby was a sweetheart. His mama would bake meat pies for our meetings, and he was a complete joy to work with. Bobby also owned a similar business to Scotty, but Bobby's business was more advanced, did more types of jobs, and also serviced the same area. So I submitted a service request to port all of Scott's seven CTNs to Bobby's account, and I waived the fee. So all of a sudden, hundreds of Scott's customers would think they were calling Scott, but they'd get Bobby. Bobby had all his calls routed to his secretary, Ashley, who was an angel. Ashley was also a wickedly talented saleswoman, and I know for a fact that she'd be able to take Scott's clients and convert them for Bobby. So that's what I did. I had those seven CTNs ported over to Bobby. This did a few things that benefited nearly everyone involved. Bobby got more business. I produced more leads for Bobby, which means Bobby was comfortable with spending more money with me, which meant I made more money and Scott's old customers got better service. Part six, capitalize on my revenge. At the next performance meeting with Bobby, Bobby was very pleased with the sudden uptick in new customers. He even asked me, what did you do to my account? I smiled and said, well, I reviewed your account and made a few tweaks. Have you seen any improvement? He absolutely did. He asked me, did this cost me anything extra? And I go, nope. He ended up increasing our spend with us by about 40% on additional services. I googled Scott's business about a year later. He wasn't in business anymore. Wonder why? No, my company never caught on to me porting over the numbers, and I strongly suspect that our legal department would not have been pleased. Sued the HOA president. He keeps finding me, so I ruined his HOA. Click the video on your screen so you get this awesome story, and I'll see you there.